both. Yeah, sure. So, hello, everybody. This is Glasgow Tea's third session of the year. So we're doing okay. Uh, we took over the group only three months ago, four months ago. So we're we're, we're keeping a steady pace, steady pace. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this, for us here in Glasgow, grey Thursday evening. Um, I'm, I think because of our speakers today, we've got some attendees from far and wide, which is really exciting for us. We're usually just a couple of Glasgow-based students just chatting about how rainy it is. Um, but yeah, so we're really, really excited today to hear from um, Patricia and Lindsay uh, to tell us about systematic reviews, scoping reviews, and just some other really interesting things that will be really useful for us as students, but also anybody really here that's attending. So I'm going to pass over to Patricia and Lindsay to get us started, introduce themselves. Um, the only thing I would say is, if you can... Uh, keep your mics off when Lindsay and Patricia are speaking and presenting. That's how it's going to start. And then we'll have time for questions at the end when the recording will finish. And if that's okay with everyone, we'll kick off. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Patricia Ayala. I'm a research services librarian at Christine at the University of Toronto, Canada. And... My name is Lindsay Sakura. I am a research librarian at the Health Sciences Library at the uh, University of Ottawa. So uh, we wanted to have as much time for discussion through, and so our presentation is really only going to take about half an hour tops uh, and then happy to take any questions or discuss anything you want. Lindsay has a dot joke prepared uh, and she'll do a Scottish accent. I have all the coffee jokes you need. Um, so I'm going to start off the presentation and I'm going to share my screen, uh, so bear with me. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yep, all good from us. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, barriers and facilitators uh, for early career researchers conducting systematic or scoping reviews in the health professions. Uh, so this is our research. We started with a scoping review and we'll talk about the other components of uh, the study and where it's going and everything else uh, that's happening. Uh, so conflicts of interest, uh, no one, because there's more people on the team, uh, no one has any conflict of interest, and I just had to declare that I'm um, ambassador for the Center for Open Science and the Open Science Framework, which is not really a conflict, it's just to say, like, um, you know, I promote these tools um, for anyone who wants to learn uh, about them and uh, to support open science, transparency, and reproducibility. So I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to discuss that um, after the meeting. So the rest of the team, Shona Kirtley, our colleague from Oxford, Patrick LaBelle, a research librarian in the Social Sciences University of Ottawa, and Erica Linton from the University of Toronto. Erica contributed to the project, but has since left the team. She's got a baby and, you know, is busy with other life stuff. Okay, some acronyms, because we're going to be using them frequently. ECRs are early career researchers, SRs, systematic reviews, and SCRs, scoping reviews. In trouble there for a bit. Okay, so here's some context for everyone. In the health sciences and medicine, there are, I mean, actually, I would say in, in all disciplines, there's been an explosion of systematic reviews. A lot of noble synthesis or what we call evidence syntheses, which are systematic reviews, scoping reviews, rapid reviews. And just to give you some context, like 22 systematic reviews published daily. Um, and again, like this is not only on medicine. Early career researchers often struggle with these study types. Um, there's many steps involved. It takes up quite a bit of time, and there's actually a lot of different skill sets that need to go uh, into being able to complete one. Uh, a lot of individuals don't have uh, the foundational skills from the outset, um, and because we currently still, in a lot of places, the majority of universities and academia still sort of operates in a model of publish or perish. Um, that drives a lot of the issues because people feel compelled, I'm going to quote Doug Goldman here, for career reasons to produce research that they're ill-prepared to do. And again, the other issue is journals, right, like that continue to publish uh, 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 poor research. 
And so we need some strategies to help reduce this because uh, it really, this could be avoidable and it's wasteful research. Um, and while they're considered gold standards, you know, this comprehensive synthesis of the evidence out there, if it's done correctly, but because they're conducted poorly um, or incomplete, like they're like in a way it's, it's dangerous because you're constructing perhaps policy, patient guidelines that are based on really poor research. So here's our project overview. We started with a scoping review um, and we're at a stage now, and Liz is gonna talk about this more of surveys and interviews uh, for early career researchers and librarians on those two latter steps. So why do we do this? I mean, the reality is that knowledge synthesis methods are complex and are challenging and are frequently changing. The problem is that there is a gap in training and mentorship. And as I spoke a little bit just now about there's a misalignment in rewards and incentives. And then the future, it's like a question is for all of us, what can we do about this? Because the reality is these methods are challenging. They require a variety of skills and expertise, methodologies, subject matter experts, statisticians, information specialists or librarians. Um, they can't be done by one person, it's a team sport. Um, and that's written into the methods and there's a variety of reasons for that. It's primarily to reduce bias, not to mention that like I said, there's a, there's a lot of work and they take minimum a year to complete. Um, it depends on the type of review. Rapid reviews can be done um, faster, but they're for different purposes. They have a different purpose as well. Um, there are a lot of leadership and governance components that are never discussed, are not usually discussed in the methods like um, project management, training, communication, documentation. Um, as I mentioned before the time, the other difficulty is that a lot of these, these methods continue to evolve, right? Which is a good thing in the sense that, you know, handbooks are being updated. Cochrane just had a big update last year. You know, JBI, Joanna Briggs Institute keeps updating scoping. Maybe actually, they have methods for a variety of knowledge syntheses, but, you know, there's still not one um, sort of like, no, this is the way that everyone has to conduct it. Um, and so there are components and because people are still trying to figure it out, right? And so new methods are being uh, sort of written um, and altered and edited. And there's some that there's still no set definition or it's not, okay, we have to follow this method. It's like there's just set of best practices and recommendations. Uh, and so as you can imagine, it's hard to also figure out, oh, this, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it, uh, you know? And, and if you, again, you kind of sort of offered um, a bouquet of options. Um, and that's one issue. The other issue is that even with a bouquet of options present, people don't follow <laughs> one established method. Um, and, and it's the same thing with the reporting guidelines, right? Like they're trying to come up with reporting guidelines for each of these study types. Um, but as you've seen, many of them are still in process or are being constantly updated or some are just brand new because there is an exponential growth and explosion in the evidence, meaning the literature, additional resources and time are needed to synthesize uh, the information into one of these study types. So the problem is, um, I've yet to see a method, a handbook that actually provides um, examples of practical aspects. So a method uh, may be Best practices indicate to conduct pilot testing for screening and data abstraction, but they don't tell you how to do that. And if they do, it's like pick a random sample of this, but they also never tell you um, exactly every step involved or show you illustrative examples um, of this is how this team did it. And that's the truth too for a lot of the published articles out there, even good reviews, even good systematic or scoping reviews. And so we conduct, we calibrated, blah, 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 but they never show you all the material. And I talk about that, which is an important point um, for our project, because we really wanted it to also, and which is all available via OSS, every single presentation that we've given, every single aspect of our project from the search strategies to the peer review of the search strategies, to the manuscripts, to the protocol, the calibrated, everything is there, because we also wanted this to be um, a pedagogical sort of component, right? We wanted it to be like an example for people to use um, and feel free to go peruse and grab whatever you need from there uh, and use it to your own research, for your own research. Yeah. Or yeah, to, or also, to, 
I'm sorry, right, Patty, I, just want to I just want to mention as well that we got down to, to be so transparent for our project, we even included personal communication, right? Like the emails that we sent, like those were also part of our OSF grouping just to show how we made decision-making, right? Now, obviously they were stripped for sensitive information and that kind of thing, but we also recorded, I just wanted to mention that because those key decision-making decision, key decision-making decisions, um, they're so important as well, because then you can go back and be like in two years, why do we make that decision or not? So I just wanted to highlight that as well um, as part of our decision-making process. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Lindsay. Yeah, those are the only things that are private um, in our project. And I kept them private um, because like Lindsay mentioned, there were uh, there's sensitive information in there too, but it was also um, to, to keep ourselves accountable, right? So Lindsay and I were the co-leads on this project. Um, and I actually took the scoping review when I was on research leave. So I was the lead doing all of these things in the training and all the documentation. And Lindsay now is the lead for the second part as part of her PhD thesis, which I'm sure she'll talk about, which is fascinating. But I also wanted the team to keep me accountable, right? Like, or, and keep each other accountable. And it's also just better triage. Oh, I don't know that uh, this email is buried down there. No, it's every single thing is there. We have even down to the nomenclature, like it was standardized as well as, as how we did everything too. Even our drafts, we have some drafts there that were like, I have no idea what we wrote. Like, you know, there's things that we kept private that was more like like the bottle of wine conversations, but they're still there that all the team who is part of that OSF project can see. Um, thanks for that, Lindsay. Um, okay, the other issue is that there's an overall gap in training that comes come down. So mentors themselves, so faculty, su supervisors are themselves poorly trained. Um, and as I mentioned before, rewards, incentives, resources, and responsibilities aren't aligned with a successful learning environment. So there's very little time protected for mentors um, for OCCRs through a project, but there's a lot of pressure to teach and publish. So there's competing interests also for people's time. So our population issue and context. So we, I mean, I guess every study has a limitation. At the beginning, we were like, let's do all the things. Let's study all the people. And we're like, no, let's focus on early career researchers. Um, because I, we do really believe that they are like um, the future. And uh, we, we wanted to focus on them because they, they really impacted, right? And so we looked around quite a bit to come down to a definition of what early career researchers um, is. And actually there were some variations. I was talking uh, to uh, Rebecca and Sarah before, uh, and Rachel before, sorry, I'm like, I'm not enough coffee, I need to sip more of this. Um, and uh, uh, we landed on this definition uh, that they're, they're typically, um, and, and we have all the citations for this too, if you wanna find those pages as well, and like um, those sources that, um, you know, like anyone, with up to five years experience or less. So that includes graduate students, postdocs, residents, fellows were also included, um, professors who will, were not tenured as well, right? So people at the beginning of their career. Uh, we also landed only on systematic and scoping reviews because again, there's many different types of knowledge synthesis out there too. Um, and we did wanna make a distinction between just literature reviews, um, so something that someone can do on their own. We really wanted to focus on these specific methodologies, um, these study types that, you know, protocol driven, methods driven uh, study types. And we sort of landed on these two. Um, and then the health sciences. Um, uh, so we have a comprehensive list of all the health sciences that I, you know, I, I, I took out from the slides just uh, to give you a break. But again, all of that is in our project. And so, so the first part, as we say, like a three part project, so the scoping review. So here's how we did it. We followed um, our methods where we followed RCN O'Malley along with refinements proposed by Levac um, at Allen Colhoun. We calibrated our level one and level two screening guidance forms. So the, the first level of screening level one means you screen the title and abstract. And the level two, after you're done screening those study types, right? Like you actually take a look at the full text of that article. Um, and we pilot tested them uh, in a set of articles to achieve 90% inter-rater reliability. That's a fancy word for like agreement. <laughs> so just to make sure that everyone is in the same place. And the way we did it was, you know, I created guidance forms and we populated them and we gave people a set of articles for them to screen. Um, and I individually kept the answers. And so what we were trying to do is test 
the guidance form, you know, how well people understood what we're going to include our next loop in the study. If there, you know, there were any discrepancies, um, we would then adjust, uh, have a discussion, and then adjust the guidance forms to better, you know, to better guide people to do it. Um, and we did the same thing for the full text of screening, um, and then also the, the data obstruction forms. People were like, at this, take that. So again, we're calibrated and tested. So we get a lot of feedback, right? Um, because again, you're trying to be, um, you're trying uh, to have as much understanding and clarity among your entire team uh, so we can proceed forward with less, um, you know, conflicts, with less confusion. And as we mentioned before, all our data training materials communication, this is hyperlinked, and I will share my slides uh, with you later, are stored um, in OSF and are open to the public. And just to give you some stats, all together from our preprints, our protocol, and all our documentation has been downloaded over 800 times. So our eligibility criteria, uh, again, a haiku version or participants who were early career researchers in health professions that examined how systematic reviews and clinical research can conduct it as a main outcome, not other knowledge synthesis in articles in English or French. And the exclusion criteria is basically if they did not focus on systematic reviews or scoping reviews as the main outcome, uh, studies who did not include ECRs or only early career researchers who were not in the health professions um, and non-empirical studies. So here's our results. Um, so we run searches in May 2018. We just updated the search in January 2021. Um, we retrieve a total of 16,274 records. We removed um, 2,646 duplicates. And so we screen like 13K plus, um, you know, records, title and abstract. And then there are 147 for full text. So the current of the original manuscript uh, that we included was nine um, we're, because we're currently processing the sweep, you know, so like the updated um, search. So uh, that number is still to be determined. And here's what we found. So the barriers, time. Um, so there's a lack of dedicated and protected time for students and faculty to undertake and facilitate training and mentorship. Um, methods, uh, there's a huge uh, lack of training and methods. Uh, some of the like sort of pain points for data analysis they found specifically challenging. Searching the literature and create an inadequate search strategy and critical appraisal. Um, and so experience and access to expertise. Uh, there are a couple of articles that mention how challenging it was to get a response from supervisors and faculty um, and training and mentorship uh, and specifically Training that you know was purely theoretical, or you know reviews were mentioned as part of one class, but in that one class, that semester course, you reviewed different types of um, epidemiological um, you know research methods, and so reviews were only given like a week or two, right? Which is not enough time um, to learn uh, the ins and outs of these study types. Uh, so facilitators, it's not, it's not a surprise, but it's actually the, the opposite of that uh, time. So protected time was essential uh, for both faculty and students. Um, I have to say that there was one article, and I remember this in particular, that mentioned how the top-down approach, so the program director was very key in dedicating, setting out protected time for uh, faculty and students as well. And that's key, right? Because most of these things, it's from the bottom up that people are like sort of advocating, you know, in the picket line, like, please give us time, please give us training. And that one in particular stuck, stuck in my head because it was like, no, 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 the part of that program was like, you need to have protected time to do this. And he's right, right? Um, methods, so uh, it's not surprising that people who had some background knowledge and training in research methods and epidemiology statistics, as well as people who have been trained in literature searching and career professionals found that particularly beneficial. Um, and training and mentorship, uh, the one thing, again, um, the training had to include a practical component where the learner was engaged at least in one step of the process to get a better understanding of what, what, what that takes and cements the theory. So say, for example, um, a class, well, like, all right, in this semester, we're going to do a scoping review or a systematic review, right? Um, and of course, you can't do it one uh, on your own. So People were set into groups, and if one person at least had to do one of these things, right? So they had to screen, and they had to understand what that meant, and that really, or 
that do that abstraction that really cemented the theory um, of what they were learning because if you don't do that it's still very abstract and it doesn't have substance and so there were some factors that were actually identified as both um, a challenge and a facilitator so peer learning uh, so people who Okay, say you're really, really good at critical appraisal. So some other peers or like early career researchers would be like, oh, get advice from them. Um, but then there were some comments that said, well, that can quickly turn into a scenario of the blind leading the blind because say said person had been trained by someone who didn't know what they were doing, but they thought they knew and they really didn't know. It could quickly led into like the blind leading the blind scenario, right? Like the blind leading the bling. Just to say, I just noticed my own typo. Um, the blind leading the bling. I think I need to incorporate that in some of my email signatures. And the other thing that was also, um, yeah, there you go. Uh, and the other thing that was also identified as though is, is that the iterative nature of the method, and particularly this is uh, for scoping reviews. So there's a flexibility to scoping reviews that is not poor planning. Just have to say that that is not poor planning, what the iterative nature of scoping reviews. Um, when they say that there is some flexibility, that doesn't mean like, oh, we really didn't know what we were doing. Anyway, people really appreciated that. It's like, okay, as you go along and you're discovering, you can find and redefine it. But then it can quickly turn into a situation where like the study escapes from your hands and it becomes something unfeasible, right? And it's really difficult to determine, uh, you know, like where the end game is. So I do want to mention this. Um, there are some additional observations. So several studies mention and encourage participants to pull others at work, but not the importance of having a well-rounded team. None incorporated any training in writing and publishing manuscripts or peer review. And none, I think maybe one said, oh, that the participant had some comment about like, oh, he felt like he had been learning to do things in a rigorous way. They didn't, just based on that article and what we saw. But none of them trained or mentioned the importance of ensuring research transparency or the proper reporting of research studies. And to me, that's actually pretty, pretty important that we didn't see in any, in any of them uh, that this was something that uh, they got training or it was even mentioned. And so now I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Lindsay. Take it away, babe. Thank you, Patty. So, um... So when, when we started doing this project, we did it because as both um, Patricia and I mentioned, we are, we're librarians, right? And so we actually get the tail end of ECRs, whatever, you know, they come to our office and they're like, okay, hey, we need help doing this. And my supervisor said, come here. And we're like, okay. So as librarians, we've really had to adapt really quickly to become methodologists as well as, you know, doing the traditional library stuff. And so, you know, when we, um, I, I do want to mention that we did submit our publication for, or sorry, our manuscript for publication, and it got rejected. And that's completely fine. Unfortunately, that's part of the process, you know, but it did lead us to looking closely at our, um, our study and being like, okay, so we need to reframe it. We probably need to add this bit of information and clarify this. So it was a really good exercise for us because you know rejection from any type of publication, it, it, it's not fun, right? Nobody's like, yes, a rejection. Um, so I just wanted to mention that that's part of the process as well because as early career researchers, you know, in my, the beginning of my career, when I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, I got rejected, but that's okay. It, I think it's really strengthened it, which is why we're updating it now. So, you know, there wasn't a gap of three years where we didn't do anything. <laughs> it, was that it was submitted and then we had to revise it. And so our hope is, is to get it out later this year. So one of the things that was interesting was as Patricia and I were talking um, a couple years ago, I decided that, you know, when reading the studies, there was always a lot of articles um, or editorials or commentaries on best practices, right? But there was hardly any on what are the actual challenges? Like they haven't actually spoken to early career researchers about what they find challenging when they do these type of knowledge syntheses. And so it got me thinking of, there was one article in the nine that we found that was actually a survey saying, hey, what are the problems you have doing systematic reviews? And they kind of outlined it that way. So that got us kind of thinking about how librarians help early career researchers with these knowledge syntheses, right? And also um, like, and how, what does that balance look like? 
So this is kind of what led to my, I'm currently um, a third year PhD student um, at the University of Ottawa in the Faculty of Education in the health professions stream. So I do health professions education, medical education. So this is what led to the survey. So this is phase one of my PhD research. Next slide. So what we wanted to really kind of get at for, you know, the nitty gritty details is, you know, we already did our SR and we, or sorry, our scoping review. And we saw that these, we have balance, you know, barriers and, and, and challenges. So when we created the surveys, we have two surveys. We had one for ECRs and then we had one for librarians. Cause the idea is, is the surveys are very similar. Obviously they're kind of changed a little bit, but they're very similar so that we can compare the responses to see exactly where those gaps are. So what are the barriers and challenges that ECRs face when they do these type of reviews? What are the barriers and challenges that librarians face when they do it? Because hopefully they line up, but if they don't, that means that we probably have to create some new resources or teaching strategies or whatever to kind of fill in the gap. Obviously within our, like, I mean, librarians don't do a lot of stats, for example, but like, how can we identify those? And then it comes down to as well, what are the barriers and challenges that librarians and health professions face when they're instructing? Because we do a lot of instruction on this. So next slide, please. So what I did um, for my PhD was, like I mentioned, there was two PhDs, uh, I'm sorry, two surveys that were distributed. And one of them was for ECRs and then one of them for librarians. So what happened was we started with um, two different listservs for the different groups and sent it out. And my goal was to have 150 responses from both groups. Now librarians, let me tell you, librarians, they love them some surveys because within two weeks, my survey went like gangbusters, okay? But ECRs were a little bit more challenging and that's understandable because if you think about who our target group are, whether it's residents, graduate students, you know, profs, like it's a pandemic, right? So residents, they're all in the hospitals. They don't have time to fill out surveys, right? And then you have, um, you know, you have PhD students who are like, I'm already drowning. Why am I gonna, you know? And so that's completely understandable, right? So I had only started with the surveys. So recently I was like, hey, ethics, um, can I kind of do an amendment to circulate my, my survey for the ECRs only? And so what I did was I, they were like, yeah, no problem. So I sent it to some colleagues who were amazing at sharing it. And then on social media, some people retweeted it too. Now I will say that if one of the things that you're looking at as a tip or a career tip for early career researchers, network, 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 even through like Twitter and online, because that's how I got it out. Once it got out that way, it literally went like gangbusters. And within a week, I was able to get up to that 150 mark that I needed. So I was like, <laughs> anyways, just telling you, recruitment is not an easy thing. But so now we're there. So now it'll make, it will make the results when we analyze them a little bit less heterogeneous when we go to it. Next slide. Um, so as mentioned before, our Eligibility criteria was very, very simple. You have to be a career, an ECR, five years or less in your current field. So for example, I've been a librarian for 12 years, but I'm currently entering medical education and I've only been in this field for like two years, right? Two, two and a half. So for me, if I were to fill out this survey, I would put on my hat as an ECR uh, in med ed because I'm new, right? And I have completed at least one systematic review because we want to get it through the whole process. So what, is one, what does completion of one systematic review mean? For us, it meant that you have, it doesn't necessarily need to be published per se, but it needs to be submitted. That was kind of the, the criteria for it. Um, so as long as it's done the whole thing and you've submitted it to a journal, or at least you put it on OSF or some sort of preprint, for me, that was good enough <laughs> because, you know, because I mean, it's, it's hard to get something published, you know, especially as an ECR. So uh, next slide, please. So here's what I have as of last Friday. <laughs> so we had um, for the ECR in French and English, we had 129, but then I checked that uh, this morning and I'm sitting at 140. So I will take it. That is great. Librarians were like 164 in French and English. So here's the thing. Um, at the University of Ottawa, we have to do everything in French and English. So I speak fluently in French and French Canadian. Um, and 
my dad, oh, I don't have it up. I'll tell you my dad joke afterwards because I need to have it in front of me. Um, <laughs> but it's about French can anyway. Um, so oh. these are the responses that, I'll get it, don't worry, we'll get there. Um, so these are the responses that we got. And it's been really interesting to kind of like look at the preliminary data on ECRs that have responded because a lot of the same, either they're like, I've only done a systematic review only, or I've only done a scoping review, or they're like, well, you know, here are the challenges. And a lot of the challenges we've identified, like we already know, right? When you work as a librarian, you know the challenges already. But then the problem comes in when you're looking at it, you're like, oh, I didn't realize that challenge. And so that's the, that's really the goal that I'm looking for. Um, and so what happens, if you can do the next slide, please. So what happens is, is now that I have these survey responses, right, with the challenges and the barriers, I want to take the interviews and I want to be like, great, let's kind of dig around that. But then I want to find the solutions. How can we make this easier? Next slide. How can we make this a little bit easier on librarians and ECRs in order to have better resources available, better teaching strategies, but whatever that might look like, infographics, I don't know, right? Like, and that's the, that's the exciting part. That is the really cool part is, you know, what are the potential facilitator solutions that we can overcome these challenges for? And I imagine that some of them are actually gonna be very similar to, for librarians and for early career researchers, and they will be different. And that's the part I wanna see, like that's the part we wanna to bring together for our project so we can make life easier for everyone else. Next slide. So the idea is for our future research, is that we are going to, like I said, we want to identify these facilitators and these, um, these solutions, but we also want to be able to be like, okay, here are the, like, as, as Patricia mentioned earlier, right, here are the issues around the challenges and the barriers. How do we break those down so that we can influence um, policy, whether it's in, like, maybe a research unit or at an institution or an organization, so that we can, for example, show that protected time leads to better results, which in the end is always good for any institution because it raises their profile, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then we want to make sure that um, depending on the population that, you know, some people have better access to resources than others, right? So we're thinking like in, in North America, we're very, very privileged, but there's a lot of countries um, that I work with, for example, in Africa, who want to do these type of studies, but they don't have access to the resources that we have because they cost a lot of money. So how can we, wh what is that balance to, you know, make free resources or easy to access resources for everyone so there's equity and not just equality? And then eventually what we want to do is um, look at these barriers and facilitators outside of health sciences or health professions, because the, key, the big thing is, is that social sciences, management, even law, they're all getting on this like scoping review, systematic review bandwagon. Like it is gangbusters. And so I don't even know what gangbusters means. Um, but it's one of those things where it is just becoming so ubiquitous to do this type of review. And so, you know, but people don't call it the right name. So the nomenclature is always off. So when someone says, oh, I'm doing a, a systematic literature review and I'm like, Oh, oh, okay. So I just imagine it's a very systematic way of doing a lit review. And they're like, no, 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 we're using Prisma. I'm like, so it, it's really around the clarification, but that's what people do, right? And it differs across disciplines. So it's really about how do we get that standardized nomenclature? How do we make sure that like from the get-go people are doing these methods, right? To reduce that research waste so that, you know, we can further improve the science and the quality that's out there. Next slide. So that is it. Um, <laughs> that's it, guys. That you know, and wear your mask. Um, I think I think our next slide has our contact information. Does it? Or a big? Well, uh, we will just open questions. It, uh, questions. Opening up for questions. Um, but yes, all contact information. Uh, I actually don't think I have it in our slides. I will add it before <laughs> I share the slides with everyone. You cannot contact us. We're done. No more. <laughs> just kidding, guys. No more. You know our Twitter accounts. That's it. You know? The big question mark just means guess. Guess who we are. Guess where you can catch. Exactly. <laughs>